Okay, so uh, welcome um, uh, from the organizing team uh, first. So uh, we are Catherine Parsons, Milena Leibold and myself. So uh, we have been organizing a webinar series uh, and the intention basically is to connect the uh, SAP community and the EAP or ENT community more closely. And so today we have our third webinar and we are very excited that we could gain two very distinguished speakers today um, Marfa Feldman and Priya Kanan, and they will talk about effectuation, bricolage, and resourcing. But before uh, we actually begin with this topic, I would briefly like to introduce our two speakers. So first, Priya Kanan is the Associate Dean of Faculty and Accreditation and the founder of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Catalyzer at the University of San Diego's Kno School of Business. She is also a professor of strategy, innovation, and entrepreneurship there. Moreover, Priya serves as a full professor of entrepreneurship at University of Exeter Business School, and she is the incoming dean at Lucas College of Business at San Jose. So welcome, Priya. Our second distinguished speaker is Marfa Feldman, and Marfa is the Johnson Chair for Civic Governance and Public Management and a distinguished professor of urban planning and public policy, business, political science, and sociology at the University of California, Irvine. Marfa received her PhD from Stanford University in 1983, and her research is on organizational dynamics, which is also informed by practice and practice theory. And I think it's also very important to mention that she has been building the routine dynamics community. So welcome, Marfa. And so that's actually from my side, and now I would like to hand it over to you, Marfa and Priya, and... Uh, I'm really looking forward to what you tell us about effectuation, pre-collage, and resourcing. Thank you, Christian. I'm very, very excited to be here today. And thank you, everyone, Melena, and everyone for organizing us. Um, the purpose of today's webinar is to introduce uh, the concept of resourcing into our discussion of entrepreneurship. And Martha, would you like to say a couple of things before I get started with slides? Um, I'm just really happy to be here. Uh, Priya and I have been um, thinking about these three concepts for a while and um, and are still thinking about them. We're eager to present where we are and uh, hear from the participants, um, uh, which you know hopefully will leave plenty of time at the end of the of the presentation um, for you all to join in. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to say that given that this is a um, heavily theoretical discussion, the way we have structured this is to walk you through a journey of how we arrived here. As Martha said, we are still thinking about it. Even as of Tuesday, we were thinking about how to present this and you know, how to talk about this. So the questions that we're exploring here today started during my dissertation research over a decade ago. And uh, I, as an, a scholar in uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, I've been very interested in how individuals accomplish their innovations, right? Entrepreneurs, how do they launch their ventures or innovations despite resource constraints and also when others do not believe in their innovations, right? And of course, the minute you discuss innovations and how entrepreneurs bring their idea to fruition, the concept of resources becomes key. And this is not surprising because the heart of any entrepreneurial pursuit is resources. As we all know in the, in the world of entrepreneurship, even the definition of entrepreneurship is a process by which individuals invest resources to pursue potential opportunities, right? Without regard to whether they or not they have access to it. And if you are like me looking at, you know, starting out, finding out, okay, how do entrepreneurs get resources? What do they do? You'll see even the earliest cited works include, you know, uh, information on how innovators will try to bootstrap or act in resourceful ways and get resources that they don't control. And, you know, and you'll find several definitions. You know, you'll see definitions of bootstrapping is how do they get their resource needs without depending on long-term external finances or additional influx of cash. Or you'll see stuff like, oh, entrepreneurs act in a resourceful way when they get more from less. Hmm. You will probably also come across concepts of, you know, effectuation, you know, when an entrepreneur has limited money, how do they go about, you know, choosing one of different ventures? Or bricolage, how do they make do with what they have? 
right? And then I also, as I was pursuing to these different concepts, organizational ingenuity. So, you know, pick, pick any of these concepts that you've come across. So one of the, as a student and as a young scholar going through is our improvisation, you know, resourcefulness, resourcing. I approached Martha at some point uh, during this and I said, you know, these are a lot of concepts I'm coming through and I also, you know, I've come across resourcing, I've come across bricolage. Can you help me understand, you know, what this is about? And then Martha basically said, you know, you know, not a jukebox solution, but you're welcome to join my practice theory group and we can explore these, you know, these uh, questions together. And so that's how uh, we started this discussion about six years ago. And, uh, but before we get into what are the differences, I know some of all of us are in different stages with these concepts and just to get a mutual understanding, we'll discuss three concepts, uh, effectuation, bricolage and resourcing, and then a deep dive into them. And the reason we are looking at these three concepts and not the others I mentioned, is we are looking at how entrepreneurs, uh, you know, repurpose existing resources, or how the use of resources gets changed for new uses. All these three concepts get added in some form. That's why we have chosen these three. Uh, so in, in the next slide, if you look at effectuation, uh, right? Effectuation is defined as a decision-making process in which the resources are given and the effects are emergent. This, and the reason we, we're talking about this first was this, was this came in 2001, right? Chronologically, this was the first concept that you know, kind of we started as in the entrepreneurship community. And uh, Saraswati uses two examples, and one of this is Kari in a hurry. So if you think back to her paper, she talks about, let's say you're an entrepreneur, you know, you have $20,000 and you're trying to start an Indian restaurant that actually with a fast food section. Now, how are you going to take it to market or bring about the idea to market with close to zero resources as possible? And she talks about this imaginary entrepreneur who could do this by, you know, she could convince an established restaurant and become a strategic partner and say, you know, invest the money in this restaurant, let's start it together. Another method for effectuation would be to convince a local Indian restaurant to carry a fast food section, right? And then she could actually select, you know, sell a selection of Indian food. Or she could actually convince one of her friends or relatives that work downtown to say, you know what, I'll bring you food and, you know, to taste. And if you like the food, we might get a lunch delivery services going. So with the same set of resources, her talents, you know, her, her interpersonal skills and $20,000, she could potentially come up with three different business models. So effectuation is about when you have the exact same starting point, but a different set of contingencies, the entrepreneur might end up building a variety of businesses. I won't belabor this, but she, uh, Saraswati in that paper in 2001 also shows how U-Haul started, you know, because after World War II, the population of the United States became more migratory and mobile. And if you think about U-Haul as a business, it, it requires a huge investment in, in terms of infrastructure. But then she talks about how with less than $5,000 or about $5,000, the founder, Ella Schoen, began, you know, establishing this, this huge industry company by using effectuation, by convincing friends and families and others to make down payments on trucks, you know, contracting with service station outlets, buying spaces. And so this was, you know, again, this is again an example of how effectuation happens. And effectuators start with who they are, what they know, whom they know, right? Their own traits and competencies and abilities, and what, you know, what knowledge corridors they are in, what are the social networks they're a part of. So you look at these different factors and that's how effectuation happens. So that was something, you know, all of us, and that is, that's a concept all of us are sort of familiar with in this community. So that's the first concept that we thought was interesting as it relates to resourcing. The second one is bricolage. So one of the papers, again, this is 2005, you know, Baker and Nelson, that paper, you know, after 2001 as a fluctuation, this is 2005. So as you, as you see, bricolage is a process of making do with readily available resources and combining them uh, for new purposes. And Baker and Nelson in their original study, they took about 29 resources. And, and one of the important things about bricolage is these ventures have to be in a penurious environment. So they took about 29 firms. And uh, two of the innovations that stood out for us, for Martha and I, as we are going through this, is a billing system. They talk about, you know, a billing system where a software with a spreadsheet, this innovator connected the code and created a homegrown software. So the story is that uh, Jason Bond was working as a billing manager for a startup wireless telecommunication company. It was serving 20,000 customers. 
And the firm relied on an outmoded software to build customers. It made it very hard. Lots of billing clerk hours were spent. It was manual. It was complicated. It made it made the company uncompetitive because they couldn't kind of do a lot of things. But they didn't have money to buy a whole new software to deal with this. So Jason used self-programmed skills and then automated the system in a way that the uh, all the work, a lot of the work done by billing clerks came down was automated. And Jason's bricolage allowed his firm to avoid investing in any of the billing clerks in you know billing clerk salaries and other other uses. The other example in this paper that stood out was uh, Tim Grayson, who was a farmer. His land was crisscrossed by abandoned coal mines, and he knew that the tunnels was a problem because they collapse, they cause sinkholes in fields, they have lot you know large quantities of methane, which is a toxic greenhouse gas. So this was a liability and, you know, what do you do with something like that? So he said, you know, so he tried to convert it and he succeeded. He was, you know, he tried to produce electricity with, uh, he produced electricity with the generator. And when the generator was actually used and it produced considerable waste, he, he built a greenhouse for hydroponic tomatoes. And then with the heated water from the generator schooling system, and then now you have this greenhouse uh, full, you know, you have, you know, nutrient rich water right? And now he was able to use tomatoes and also grow fish, which is a tropical delicacy, tilapia, in the U.S. So he was able to use uh, mines, which were a problem, to create, generate electricity, sell it, make money, and start a venture doing multiple things. So these are like two excellent examples of bricolage in that paper. And at this point, I'm going to turn it out to Martha to talk about resourcing. So the an initial resourcing paper was actually published in 2004, but it's a newcomer to the entrepreneur literature. So we put that, put it in this order. Um, and the, the emphasis in resourcing is on how a thing becomes a resource. Um, and the idea is that things like assets and materiality and skills are only potential resources until an action or a practice connects them to a schema in a way that energizes or empowers the schema. So that's the resourcing, um, is the energizing of the schema. I developed this idea when I noticed in my field work that um, the organization I was observing um, moved from decentralized to centralized hiring and training practices and that they ended up with a resourcing schema, kind of individualistic schema for problem solving, whereas they used to have a com more community oriented um, schema for problem solving. Um, so that was kind of counterintuitive since it moved to a more centralized thing, but ended up less community oriented, um, more individualistic. Um, and this happened when nobody in the organization wanted that outcome. Um, and so that led me to kind of thinking about how these practices change what kinds of schema we can um, enact in an organization. Um, talking through that example would take most of the rest of this uh, presentation. So, um, uh, so I'm going to use a microfinance example that Monica Warline and I used in the in a 2016 uh, AMLE publication. Um, and microfinance is basically a complex set of practices that connects various assets that people without material wealth have to the schema of banking. Um, so that they can take so that they can be part of that schema. Um, so the, um, the, here I'll just give a brief example. It's like, like I said, it's a complex set of practices. Um, and we talk about quite a few of them, um, in that 2016 paper, but here I'll just talk about one, which is it really at the core of banking and lending, um, which is, um, that traditional banking practices connect material wealth with lending, um, such that material wealth is a resource. We call it collateral um, for getting a loan. And you have to have material wealth. You have to have collateral in order to get a loan. Um, 
So the people developing microfinance were wondering how is it that we can provide loans to people? <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> we can provide loans to people who don't have um, material assets. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh -um. So they had to figure out a set of practices that would allow them to create a resource. Um, and the practice that is quite well known is the practice of um, developing uh, accountability groups um, so that people have what they call now social collateral as opposed to material collateral. Um, so those, the, the, those practices of creating the groups, um, creating the accountability are what develop the resource which connects it to um, the ability to give a loan. And later in the talk, we're going to talk about um, a, a more recent example that has come up and uh, that came up in a uh, in an NPR um, uh, uh, in a radio um, uh, talk, uh, and we'll put the link in for you guys to follow it later. Um, but um, it's it, but it relates to a practice that all of us engage in and all of us have been subject to, which is the practice of grading and thinking about what that resource is. So uh, later in the talk, we'll, um, it will engage you in some conversation about grading and the possibility of ungrading um, and what that resource is. So now I think Priya is gonna pick up the next. That's the next slide. So one of the questions, why are we exploring these concepts? And if you, and you have to animate it, the next two, why don't we click on the next two points? Uh, uh -huh. So why are we um, exploring these concepts? Because again, as you can see, as we explained through, you know, effectuation, bricolage and resourcing, they all relate to the creation and use of resources. And the second reason why we are looking at these, uh, that we have to explore these concepts, is that each of these concepts help us see different parts of the relationship between actions and resources, right? Different actions, what kind of resources <laughs> they create. And so now we're going to look into, given these three uh, concepts, what are the differences, what questions do they help us answer, and why do we care? And I don't think I'm actually uh, doing it, uh, giving away the end of the suspense novel by saying that I strongly believe that as you're looking at resourcing, we are, as in the entrepreneurship community, we are leaving a lot on the table by not using the power of resourcing. So Martha, can you go to the next slide? Uh, okay, so, uh... So as I said earlier, Priya and I have been thinking about this for a while um, and trying to identify the distinct features that uh, each of these ways of thinking about uh, the creation of resources provides us. Um, and um, so we, we, we developed lots and lots of tables. We won't, um, we're only gonna present this one, and then we're going to move to uh, some spotlights. Um, but there are kind of lots of lots of things that we've um, uh, been thinking about, um, and uh, hopefully these these are ones that are distinctive um, and that will kind of uh, help you and us see the differences. Um, so one of the first uh, issues is the theoretical base. Um, which in effectuation, Sarasvati is very clear that the uh, theoretical base that she draws on is decision-making. Um, and she particularly draws on the work of March and Simon and March's later work that kind of decenters goals because that's one of the things that's really um, uh, central to her way of thinking. Um, the bricolage, um, by contrast, um, builds from the work of Levi Strauss, um, who identified two different ways of dealing with knowledge. So he identified the engineer who um, builds on who builds knowledge deductively, and the bricoleur who builds knowledge inductively. And from that, the bricolage literature and, and Baker and Nelson have uh, kind of drawn on the idea of making do with resources at hand. 
And the resourcing idea uh, draw, builds on practice theory, um, where uh, which is uh, based on the work of Bourdieu and Giddens. Um, and um, uh, the emphasis in practice theory uh, is very much on the relationality of concepts. Um, so um, kind of taking things that are otherwise seen as separable or even opposite, like actions and structures or individuals and institutions or subjective and objective and showing how they're related to each other. Um, in this case, um, the, the things that are otherwise seen as separable um, but are seen as in relation and inseparable are resources, actions, um, and schema. So they also each have different kind of orientations, um, which in effectuation is very much an entrepreneurial, um, very consistent with the entrepreneurial focus of optimizing the use of scarce resources. Um, in bricolage, the orientation is to solving problems and making opportunities. And as Priya just mentioned, it's uh, very much in the um, in the domain of a penurious environment. Um, so where there's something, where there's a lack of something, um, uh, how can we how can we make do? Um, but uh, but also, how can we find new opportunities, as the tilapia example shows? Um, and uh, resourcing is about um, the relationship of practices to schema. They also each have different level of analysis. Um, so effectuation um, is very much at the level of individual decision making. Um, so it's the individual entrepreneur and what he or she can do. Um, and with bricolage, uh, we started out thinking it was individual, but then we noticed that some of the examples in the Baker and Nelson um, uh, article have small groups of people. So we just called it local trial and error. Um, so it could be the individual, you know, MacGyver is the, is the kind of standard example of a bricoleur. Um, and, and a lot of the examples in the paper that they provide, the foundational paper that they wrote, um, are examples of, of individuals, but there are also small groups of people who uh, figure out what will work in that penurious environment. Uh, and here is the maybe, you know, one of the big differences with practice theory um, that um, the idea is collective practice. It's not, an, it's not individual actions, although people do take action um, in this context, but, um, but, the, but practice is at the level of uh, a collectivity. So, um, you know, hiring practices or training practices or budgeting practices, um, things that um, that are recognizable um, to um, uh, it, th things that are th that are broadly recognizable um, are uh, the domain of practice theory. So, and we can talk about that later if you if you want to talk about that more. Um, so, as we were um, talking about all of this and making up these charts, uh, we realized that we were increasingly talking about what does this what does this make us focus on? What does this spot? In fact, Priya kept using the term spotlight. What does this spotlight? Um, so we develop the next set of um, kind of the uh, the more empirical orientations um, of the um, uh, of the theories um, as uh, as these spotlights um, so um, what does what's the empirical orientation of effectuation um, it's decision makers and decision making so it's that process is really what um, that that theory focuses on empirically. Um, 
By contrast, bricolage really focuses on the materials and skills available in penurious environments. Um, and the um, resourcing theory focuses on organizational practices and routines. Um, the, um, there's also a different temporal orientation for each of these ways of thinking about resource creation. Um, and um, so effectuation is really focused on, it's focused on next steps, but it's also focused on making next steps or making changes that are permanent if successful. Um, that distinguishes it a bit from bricolage um, which is also focused on next steps, um, but next steps that solve current problems and open new opportunities. Um, there's a rather long discussion in the Baker and Nelson um, article about some of the problems of organizations that come to rely on bricolage as an ongoing, um, uh, ongoing way of operating um, and that that is something that is um, not as effective. Um, so, um, uh, so, so the, you know, the focus really is on a more uh, immediate future as opposed to effectuation, which is a little bit more on the immediate future as it affects the long-term future. Um, by contrast, um, the temporal orientation of resourcing is really the current and because current is always associated with past. So practices, it, it, collective practices continue through time. Um, and so if you're looking at what's happening now, um, you're probably also um, understanding how that's been happening for a while. Um, but because it's kind of empirically looking at what is being resourced, um, the, um, the issue is kind of current practices and current schema. Um, so I put in a kind of grayed out um, uh, font here, um, future possible practices, um, because that's part of, um, I, I'm learning from Priya, that's part of the um, entrepreneurial orientation um, is to think about change and how you can change things. And that's consistent with the microfinance um, example is kind of thinking about how could we resource something different? Um, but the initial focus was really on what is being resourced now. Um, and finally, um, each of these theories, oops, sorry, each of these theories, no, the first two theories really talk about um, constraint challenge. It's, uh, and, and so we started thinking about whether that's also relevant to resourcing. Um, and again, effectuation is really, um, Sarasvati is very, um, uh, focused on kind of moving away from the idea of organizing around pre-existent goals. Um, so sh she uh, points out that kind of that um, leads to a situation where you think about what resources do I need to get in order to, to have to, to meet those pre-existent goals as opposed to thinking from what do I have to then what can I do? What are the range of things I can do? Um, so uh, the, cha the challenge is to move away from this kind of decision-making process um, that um, focuses on pre-existent goals. Um, in bricolage, um, the, uh, again, uh, Baker and Nelson are, uh, uh, very, very much focus on the idea that bricolage challenges institutional constraints and traditional ways of solving problems. Um, so that's one of the ways that we um, kind of come up with new solutions is to be 
uh, able to ignore um, the standard operating procedures um, or um, the ways that uh, the, sol the problems have been solved in the, in the past. A lot of bricolage examples come up where you don't have the materiality to solve the problems in the old way. So you need to solve the problems in some new way and you need to put things together in a new way. Um, which automatically means you're move you're you're doing something that's non-traditional. Um, in terms of constraints, um, I strained a little bit to think about this um, with uh, uh, respect to resourcing. That you can think about the constraints that are resourced through practice. Um, so again, the microfinance example is, is pretty good in saying, oh, well, um, these traditional banking practices um, make it difficult to provide banking and provide loans to people who don't have material wealth. So that's a constraint. Um, and what are, you know, and how are our practices resourcing that constraint um, with also help us think about what are different kinds of practices we could engage in order to resource other kinds of constraints. And our next uh, spotlight is the entrepreneur's question, which I'm going to hand over to our entrepreneur expert. What's that? Can you put one of them one by one? Oh, yeah. Sorry. So when you think about effectuation and I'm the entrepreneur, I'm thinking about, as we said during the discussion, right? What effects can I imagine or the aspirational goals and how can I, you know, bring them about, right? Given what I have, what I know, who I know, how am I going to make it happen? So that's the entrepreneur's question. So if you think about bricolage and I'm thinking as an entrepreneur, when I say entrepreneur is also the entrepreneurial scholars research question. That's how I look at it from both ways. So when you look at bricolage, Martha, um, next point, slide. When you look at bricolage, you're looking at, you know, given what I have, how can I put together what I have to make things happen, right? And when you look at resourcing, the question, the entrepreneur question is, what schemas are we resourcing? Now, this is fascinating for me because this is what led me to Martha, right? What schemas are we resourcing and how am I creating assets out of what could be a potential constraint? We go to the next slide and that's what um, we would like to continue talking about. Um, is why does focusing on practice help entrepreneurship scholars? So this is kind of the last slide and we'll get into it. And uh, Martha and I are also in a um, conversation right now. I wouldn't want to call it an argument. I think of resourcing <laughs> as a you know theory of change and stabilities. And you know, she, she was mentioning about, so the reason I talk about this is in my work, I've used resourcing as a way entrepreneurs go in to get their innovations done. So in, in, in one of my papers, so this is a, so these are innovators in large companies, right? Corporate entrepreneurs. If you want to launch an innovation within the company, all of us know it's really hard. So the way entrepreneurs succeed is by resourcing the dominant practices or existing schemas in the company and showing how innovation fits in those schemas, right? Which means they're like, oh, this is what you're doing. This is exactly how my innovation fits into yours. So those that's what they resource their existing practices which was awesome for me, right? As a young scholar doing this stuff, I'm like, this is great, innovation's done, my job is done. But what I realized is that as I, you know, move through my career stages and my research work, and, you know, I'm taking on the deanship now at San Jose State, I'm like, how do we change institutions? You can change institutions by reinforcing existing schemas over and over again. And this is when, you know, you realize that there is more that resourcing has we absolutely can use it to talk about innovation and how you can launch innovations in as an entrepreneur, but also it has a lot of power to, you know, to create or practice how you can change things in institutional entrepreneurship. And when you look at institutional entrepreneurship, uh, one of the challenges institutional entrepreneurs face is that, uh, you know, the existing institutional arrangements benefit those, the, the you know, the those have, that have established privileges. And so they will keep defending the current situation and the practices that are being that are being practiced, right? To give you an example, you know, educational institutions right now are, we can all attest to it, are going through turbulent times like never before. 
And we as educators know collectively that we have lots of challenges. And one of the key challenges is how do we make our institutions more inclusive and relevant to today's environment? And as, as teachers in the classroom, one of the key pieces of the practices is a practice of grading, right? We all do grading, and I know that's one of the most controversial topics in faculty meetings and promotion committees is like, you know, do we do a curve, right? Do we, do we grade on a curve? Do we grade on this? So let's say I want to change this, or all of us want to change these practices. The first question we'd ask is, what are we resourcing by, um, by say, let's say, let's do a curve, you know, curving in the class. Everyone gets an A, B, or a C, depending on one third of the class gets. What are we doing here? We are trying to weed out students by saying, let's do the top one third, mid one third, and bottom one third. We are not resourcing learning. Then how would we resource learning to change institutions, right? So one of the practices I have done, and Martha has a similar example, which I got in trouble as I was going through my tenure and promotion process, was in my class, you could, when you write a paper, you can come back to me as many times as you want, and I will help you to get an A. It's not about who gets an A, who gets a B. If you're interested, you work with me, I will keep helping you resubmit as many times to get an A. There was another colleague of mine um, at the University of San Diego who used to say that you can pick whether you want to get an A, B, C, or D, and you, I can help you get the grade that you... So that gives a lot of agency to the students. And there we are resourcing learning and uh, rewards for learning in a different way. Martha, would you want to share your example as well here? I kind of think it's enough. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, those so, are two good examples. So maybe okay. it'll come up later. So one of the challenges, you know, the, talking about the NPR study and, you know, uh, the NPR talk that Martha said she put in the chat is right. how do we ungrade? If you're trying to make, you know, uh, if you're trying to make university environments more inclusive, the question is how do we ungrade and how do we help students? So I would like to open this up for discussion also, as Martha puts it in, and offers a few comments. So um, as how do we ungrade, how do we resource learning and educational institutions if that is what we want to do as institutional entrepreneurs, to make this more inclusive. And that's where I think the power of resourcing comes in, not just to, you know, get resources, which like, you know, physical, when I say resources, tangible, right, intangible financial resources and other kinds of traditional strategy defined resources versus how you can create institutional change as institutional entrepreneurs.